We're talking today about how to save up to five hours a week using outreach more efficiently and effectively. We've got tips for organiz organization, for time management, features that you didn't know were there that you probably should use, but maybe aren't. Just really fantastic deep dive today. And to help us do that, we've got Jacob Turner. He is the founder and CEO of Zebra Consulting. Thanks for being here, Jacob. It's great to see you. We've also got Roberto Carrero. Uh, he is an enterprise account executive at Sapper Consulting, very close outreach partner. Hey, Roberto, good to see you again. And uh, so both both of you, correct me if I'm wrong, are former outreachers too, right? Yeah, Sorry. I was uh, an SDR at Outreach for two years and an account executive at Outreach for two and a half years. Uh, yeah. That's quite a while. That's right. And you too, Jacob. Yeah, I started as a CSM, uh, as the second employee. CSM didn't really mean anything back in 2015 at Outreach. Um, and by the time I left in what was like 2018, I was a senior uh, sales engineer. So, yeah. So, there's not many more people, uh, not many, many people more qualified than R Roberto and Jacob to tell us about the secret inner workings of Outreach. But one of those people might just be Sarah Oki. Uh, Sarah is a product manager at Outreach and um, knows, I think, more about our platform and our space than almost anybody. So we've got all bases covered today. And like I said, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A, but we're going to get started. This panel has prepared some really awesome tips. And so I'll kick it over to you, Jacob. Take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Colin. You got it. Cool. All right, so we just did some intros. Um, so I'll, this is just to show us, show you all our beautiful faces again. Um, but what we're going to be going over today, um, talked about who we are, we'll talk briefly about why we're here, but really we want to jump into what you're going to learn um, and then some next steps that you can take, some resources, uh, and then open the door. You know, I'm, I'm throw Roberto and Sarah here under the bus, but open the door for y'all to connect with us uh, on LinkedIn, right? We love. Uh, to hear from you, to get your questions, to get your feedback even. Um, you know, the community is just that. It's a community, right? We feed off of you. Uh, the beginner's mind is just as effective and efficient as the experts, right? Us working together makes all of this work. So anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so what we want to focus on really in this particular session is helping you get more time out of your day uh, using outreach. So um, before I get into that, I want to open it up for us to just introduce ourselves a little bit more. I know Colin just uh, gave us some introduction, brief introductions, uh, but I figure we can go around the table here and uh, give ourselves a little bit of um, time to introduce ourselves and what we excel in so you can get to know us a little bit more. So uh, Sarah, Roberto, either one of you can go first. Yeah, sure. I can start. Um, so Sarah Oki, excited to be here with you all. Uh, based in Seattle, uh, I've been at Outreach for about three years now um, and moved over. Actually, I was in competitive intelligence and I'm now in, in product management for guides specifically. Um, so deal management, deal intelligence, uh, that's what I'm going to focus on today and happy to connect uh, with you all after this. That's cool. And uh, I'm Roberto. Like I mentioned, I was at Outreach for four and a half years. Uh, so boots on the ground in the platform every day as an SDR, got promoted up to the AE position and then had to really figure out how to best use it as an AE to close deals. Um, now I'm working over at uh, Sapper Consulting and just helping teams get the most out of Outreach. Um, so excited to show you all uh, how to save some time today. All right. And again, my name is Jacob. I was the second employee of Outreach, working side by side with Andrew Kinzer and Wes and Gordon and Manny uh, and David Lewis. He was one of the first people I worked side by side with. And uh, just remembering the hot, sweaty days of working in a tiny, tiny office in, <laughs> in Fremont, uh, Seattle. And now here we are. I'm still in the ecosystem, loving uh, being here. I still feel like an employee, even though I don't work there, uh, because the community is just that rich. Such a great culture uh, of sales people who use outreach and also just the outreach team themselves. So happy to be here with you all. All right. So. Why we're here, we're here to help you. Um, that is simple as put, right? We want to make sure that you all can reach quota more effectively and save more time in your day. Like Colin said before, 
most sales hacker community members are getting uh, are forty percent more likely to reach quota, right? And we want that to grow, right? We want everybody to be reaching quota, and this is not common, right? Forty forty percent is huge. The people who are not are declining in quota, which is a sad statistic. Um, but you know, we know that community helps us all. Uh, all the ships rise, right? So that's that's why we're here. We want to help you all reach those numbers. Um, so what you're going to learn today, uh, you saw the title of the of the webinar, but we're going to help you learn these quick tips, tricks, and methods of saving time in your day, up to five hours a day. Uh, I think was it a day or was it a week? Five hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> a week. <laughs> your whole job in three hours, and then go home. Uh, that. <laughs> Uh, but, but we're going to learn some time-saving tips, um, you know, that people kind of brush over when they learn the tool initially. Um, and sometimes you're like, well, I can spend an extra five clicks to do this thing that saves me one that makes, you know, saves me a little bit of time. But that over time adds up. Right. And so we're going to talk about that as we get into the platform. So let's jump into the first piece. You all ready to go? You have anything else you want to chime in with? Let's go. All right. Sweet. Good. Oh, first things first, we want to talk about how to organize your content. Right. And the reason why this is so important is because when you're operating in your day to day and day, uh, engaging prospects, following up, things like that, how do you know you're using the right content? How do you know you're using like sequences, templates, and or snippets? Right. Knowing that information will help you get to the get to that prospect faster and more effectively with the content that we know is going to move move the needle. Right. So let's jump into the platform and we'll talk a little bit more about content and the content uh, organization. So let's jump into sequences, focus there first. So, Roberto, uh, what are some of the tips that you want to call out here in this particular section of the platform? Yeah, before we jump into um, the details here, I just want to give us like a, a high level uh, point on this before we jump straight into it. Um, so in my experience working with a lot of customers over the years, um, and now even with customers in, in other platforms, I think this is more of a, a higher level thing than just outreach. People end up creating a lot of sequences in general, right? Sometimes they end up getting cloned. Sometimes uh, people just have brand new ideas and you get excited and a lot of sequences end up in, in the platform. Um, I've seen teams with 50 sequences. I've seen teams with 100 sequences. Jacob, you've probably seen people with a thousand sequences in their instance, right? Um, so then when you, when you log in here, it becomes hard to find and you're not really sure what's really working and what's not working. Um, and that'll impact you in two ways. So we're gonna talk about two different things here. We're gonna talk about like how to get organized in like the actual sequence view so you can understand uh, what content you should be using. And then there's like the day-to-day -day workflow of it, right? Like how do you find the sequences in your day-to-day -day as you're putting prospects into workflow? Those are the two main things that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so one thing that I would think about um, in this sequence view I would start to go through the, the workflows and understand like, what sequences are getting the highest open rates or the highest reply rates or dig into the actual sequence itself and understand, well, what sequences are netting me the most meetings, right? Um, in a separate view in the, in the outreach sentiment, you can actually understand like what kind of positive replies you're getting through certain templates and workflows. Um, so using everything that outreach gives you at your disposal, you can then start to go through and start to pick off some of the sequences um, that are most successful or sequences that you want to compare against each other. Um, so Jacob, if you just want to start clicking on a couple of sequences that you find interesting here, like let's say, let's group some of the outbound sequences together. So sure. at the top, like outbound sequence first touch maybe executive sequences. So I would just go through the list based on what I just mentioned in terms of what, what sequences are netting me the, the most results. And I would start to apply specific tags to these sequences. Um, so an idea could be like top outbound sequences, top inbound sequences. Maybe they are certain events or campaigns that you're running, things that you just wanna get organized and get very clean, right? So Jacob, just add a tag here for, anything of an example for like an outbound sequence. 
And the, the concept that we want to talk about here is just leveraging smart views for your sequences, right? Um, and like I mentioned, they could be for a multitude of different situations. We're just going to show you the actual process of setting one up. Um, so you just want to tag the appropriate content. And then on the left-hand side, or where Jacob's showing you, you can actually click into the actual uh, tag there. And you can see that now just these sequences that we have tagged are now pulling up. And now we can save these as a specific smart view down there on the, the left-hand side, All right? Just as a quick call out here, um, I noticed for me, my layout's a little bit different. I've seen customers with uh, updated layout as outreach continues to evolve and uh, become more effective. So if it doesn't look exactly like this, your smart view button might be at the top or something like that, but just look for the word smart view. I think I'm in an older uh, app um, environment. So anyway, I just wanted to call that out for y'all. All good, all good. Um... That's the meta concept here, right? Understand what workflows are working, um, what may not be working, and then start to just parse these out into different smart views, inbound, outbound, specific campaigns. If you're leading a team, maybe you just want to use your team specific sequences if that's how you have it set up. Um, but that's my meta concept here. Jacob, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'll just add that once you create this smart view, um, like these are extra clicks, right? This is kind of what I was mentioning before. It takes longer in this moment for me to create a smart view than it does to just find the sequence I'm looking for and add a prospect to it, right? So it might take me three clicks to go just add the prospect in. It might take me 10 clicks to create this smart view, but right, we're investing in ourselves. We're investing in our future selves because now the next time that I go find the sequence, all I have to do is one click. Right. So instead of spending the three clicks it normally takes you to go add a prospect to a sequence without having this organizational tactic, it was only going to take you one. Right. So now it's that much faster every single day of your life. <laughs> right. So these 10 clicks are an investment in your future time savings. So I just wanted to add that to it. We got a, I, I, I don't know if you guys are able to keep an eye on the chat, but I did ask folks here how many sequences they have in their outreach instance. We've got a couple of folks who are, Pretty efficient, like three max, five to seven max, John Farmer said. Um, and then, you know, many of us have more than 50. A couple of folks have hundreds or, or, or over a thousand, which brings me to the question from Samantha. Uh, thanks for asking this question, Samantha. How many sequences is too many sequences? Ooh. Jacob, you want to go first? That is a great question, first of all. <laughs> um, uh, there's a, a bad answer to this and it's, it depends. Um, the good answer is I would say too many sequences is anything beyond 10 um, because there's five core sequences that you're going to want uh, for most scenarios that you run into. And this kind of the depends part is it depends on your market, what you're trying to sell, how you're selling it, you know, what your internal best practices are. Uh, but I would say there's five core sequences and you want those core sequences to be like, um, you know, five of them are meant for decision makers and the other five or like high profile customers that you want to have a manual touch with. And the other five sequences for should be more automated for low touch scenarios where you don't want to spend a lot of time doing manual touch points or phone calls. Um, so they're essentially going to be very similar with the content, except one's going to be more automated, one's going to be more manual. Right? That's that's what I would recommend there. That is a very broad recommendation, though. Um, and I'm sure Roberto might have a different say. Sarah might have a different opinion about that. Uh, but off the top of my head, that that number 10 shoots out, and it's, it's pretty easy to manage that many. Yeah. Um, my take on this is that it, it really depends on the team size. Um, and it really depends on the different workflows that you have, right? Some of us are outbound, some of us are inbound, some of us go to events. Um, some of us have like really large teams that want to do things just a little bit different. Um, I can't give you like a clear number, but I would say if you have a bunch of dead sequences in there, I would take the time to go in, audit them, clean out some of the stuff that's no longer being used. Jacob, I think we're going to talk about naming conventions here in a bit, which should which should help with like an audit process, but this smart view process is just a quick way to, to look past some of, the, some of the stuff that you're not using. Um, but in terms of like a sequence number, I would say 
30 max and that's probably being generous um but we're gonna we're gonna help you kind of trim that down if you're one of those people that has a thousand <laughs> right yeah that's a great question yeah thanks Chris. Yeah. So one of the things, well, let's wrap this smart view thing up because I, we showed you how to create these, but I want to show you how to also utilize it. And then I'll jump into the naming conventions and kind of loop that into this whole conversation. So I created this smart view. I'm using it based on the, uh, the tag, which says top sequences. There's other filters that you can add to this to do more detailed smart views. We're not going to go too deep into that right now. Um, but if I want to create this, now I have my smart view over here on the left hand side. You can see I've clicked on this where it says smart views. The other sort and filter options are right here where you can do, is it part of collection? What's the rule set? Is it, what's the state? Things like that. We're not gonna get into that. So, so my top sequences are here. If I click on sequences again, it's gonna bring me back to my entire list, right? If you have thousands of sequences, you know that you have to scroll pretty far or do some work to search for that sequence. Now all I have to do is click on that smart view and it takes me directly to those three sequences that I've outlined as being the ones I want to always use, right? For that specific scenario, this is my top outbound sequences. Maybe I have a top inbound, maybe I have a top follow-up, right? This is where you can create multiple smart views to uh, speed up the process of finding the content that you need. Cool. Uh, Jacob, I think one thing to, to call out here is the, um, the collections. Right. So like actually using these in a workflow, um, I think we should go through that if uh, if you can get that from here. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can see here that I have two sequences that are a part of my uh, outbound collection. I'm going to actually add this third one to it. So we just cl click up here, add to collection. And this will show you a list of the collections that your admins have created for you. If you don't have collections set up right now, have your admins reach out to me. I will help them <laughs> the collections. Collections are normally admin regulated, right? So we want to make sure that you have them, but also if your admin hasn't created, it's not because they don't want to, it's because they might not know how you are going to utilize it. So uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Ask for some of these features that you might learn about today. Um, so once we add it to the collection, the collection essentially allows us to find the sequences when we're in our sales motion. Right. Uh, I want to be clear here that we're looking at sequences here. This is not where you add them into the sequence. Right. So you might be able to find the content and see what it does and what the process is in each one. So you get familiar with them. Um, but when you're in the platform and you're executing a task, let's say for Oprah Winfrey here, uh, you know, and you want to drop Oprah into a sequence, a sequence, you click the sequence button and you have to scroll all of the thousands of sequences you have. Right. But if you have content collections set up because tags don't work in this particular page, you click the drop down here and you'll see now you can have those collections at your fingertips. You click the training dash outbound and it gives you those same three sequences that you've tagged. Right. This is where tags and collections coincide, because since tags only work when you're looking at a sequence, um, collections allow you to actually filter that when you're in your flow. Jacob, can I, can I add one thing? I just want to like drive this home for people, okay? The smart views is so that you can enter the sequence view and identify which sequences are performing the best based on the data from the prospects you've run them through. So that's more of like, are my sequences working? That's the smart view. The collections that we're showing you now is how do I actually engage prospects through this workflow? So I can just select all of my outbound sequences have them pulled up and then execute. So there's two different concepts that we're talking about. I just wanted to like make that clear and, and drive it home. Absolutely. A couple cool. of folks in the chat also acknowledging that favoriting sequences can be helpful as well. Yes, absolutely. Favoriting is is another method to do that. It's, it's a little less granular, um, but it is, because then you can kind of get into the same boat where once you start favoriting everything, it doesn't quite categorize it. Uh, but favoriting does help you save a lot of time, especially if you have a low number of sequences you need to manage. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one more thing about content collections here, and that is we're talking about sequences for the most part. But if you didn't know this already, templates also, you know, when you're engaging a prospect through a task, there are templates uh, that can be added to those collections. So if I have outbound templates, this will also filter my list down. I don't have, I think I have follow-up. There we go. Here's all my follow-up templates. 
right? I don't have an endless scroll anymore. I have three follow-up templates. Same thing with snippets, right? If I come in here, I have all of my snippets that are uh, spread out into collections, right? So this is where you really start to gain the efficiency of using the platform where now I don't need to scroll to find specific things. I just make the collection that supercharges the workflow, allows you to save a few minutes, right? We're going to save you hours in a week, but uh, it really starts with these little features where you're saving minutes in your day, and those are going to add up to those hours. Cool. All right. Missing anything on that, Roberto? Should we move on to the next section? I think this is strong. I think we should move on to accounts. All right. Let's move on. Okay. So the next section that we're going to talk about is how to prioritize um, your accounts uh, and target them and limit all the wasted effort of finding the people you want to actually engage through your account view. Okay. So let's go back into outreach. I'm going to go back and forth like that a couple of times. So just for anyone who's getting triggered by <laughs> swipe there, <laughs> just let me know. Just got to close your eyes when I say I'm going to swipe now. Um, all right. So let's go to the account page. Okay. And this is now showing me a list of accounts. So Roberto, go ahead and uh, jump in. Let's let's talk a little bit about how you can save some time in this place. Yeah, so the, the account view. Here's one thing about prospecting nowadays. All of us want and need to be more efficient with it, right? But many of us jump into an account view and just start picking random people, random prospects to go after. And it's not really calculated. There's no real process to it, right? Um, so very similar to how we organized our sequences, we could also organize our accounts with smart views as well, right? Um, so Jacob, if you just want to go to the uh, add filter section there. One thing that I love to do when I'm prospecting is leverage these filters to parse down my accounts into more bite-sized chunks, right? So an example here could be if you use like buyer intent scores, if you want to target specific industries or location. If you're using an intent data provider, you know, Bambora, um, you can really start to break your sequences down into different tiers. Um, I'll give you all my process and the way that I think about this. I think about my accounts in terms of tiers one, two, three, and four. My tier one accounts, I want to spend 80% of my time with more personalized, high touch sequences. And my, my uh, accounts in tiers two, three, and four could have more automated steps. I call those more of a low touch, right? So once I have gone through and added the filters I want, for example, to my tier one accounts, uh, then Jacob, you could just select a handful of accounts here. I would tag these accounts as like tier one, for example, Roberto, tier one, whatever process you would want to do for that. And then very similar to how we created the smart view for the sequences, we'll do the same thing for the accounts. Uh, you could just either select the tag right there or search for it in the filter box and then hit save view up there. And then I would just save these as Roberto's tier one accounts. So now anytime I want to go into my account view, I've already done the work ahead of time and I have my target accounts. Um, one other tip that I'll give you here is if you have an SDR and AE relationship, I find this really beneficial to make smart views for shared accounts. That way, if you're having certain prospecting meetings together, um, it's super easy to go in there, understand how many prospects you have engaged in an account. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for uh, co-prospecting, tandem prospecting there. Um, so long-winded, Jacob, anything you want to add there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing just off of that, that smart view and how you'd share this, once you've created it, you're not like, oh, shoot, I got to create another one because I messed up. Just click the drop down. You'll see this is where your smart views actually exist. Um, and if you click on these three dots on the right, you can set it as your default one. Uh, so you can always see those accounts when you click on your uh, account list. But also you can come in here and edit uh, and you can share these out and make it available to all. That's how you would actually make sure that your AE or if your SDR, your AE, or if your AE, your SDRs can actually see that, that list that you've created. Um, if you do it that way, you do want to personalize this a little bit because multiple people could be creating tier one account lists. So just make sure you personalize it uh, with your name. So the person you're sharing it with knows what to look for. Okay. Money. Cool. Right. Other thing that I'll chime in with here is those filters 
that Roberto was talking about, these are these are all baked into the platform. Some of these will be populated uh, depending on your company and how they set up outreach. They may not be, right? So we want to make sure that the data is there. Uh, so if you're finding that the data is not there, this is something to talk to your outreach admin about uh, to say like, hey, I don't see the industry populated in here. Hey, I don't see the geo Right, because those are certain things that you might use as criteria to determine what a tier one account even is. Right, so whatever that criteria is for a tier one, make sure the data is there, uh, and it should relatively match what you've um, what you're using on the Salesforce side. So, with that in mind, Salesforce actually, and we'll close down here, we have custom fields. These custom fields, anytime you see a custom field in outreach, just know that it is a possibility to bring in additional data from Salesforce that doesn't already exist in outreach. Okay. So let's say you have, you sell shoes, right? Random. Uh, and you're like, Hey, I want to know what my customer's shoe size is, right? That's not an outreach standard field. Okay. So that is a field where we'd come in and we'd relabel these custom wins as shoe size. And then we would pull that data in from Salesforce into outreach. Now I can say, show me everyone with a size 13. Right. Show me everyone with a size 10, whatever the size is. Right. And this is where we can start to build even more detailed lists based on the data that we have accumulated and have been tracking on the Salesforce side. Right. This should be a marriage between the platforms where we're getting all the data we need. Cool. Jacob, looks like we have a question here from Janice who says, how can I save a list of my most engaged prospects? Um, there's several ways to do that, but there is a really good way to do that from this view. Um, so an interesting thing that we could do here is we could select two or three of these accounts. You just want to go through the process, Jacob. Yeah. Uh, and then we'd actually be able to select the prospects from within these individual accounts that we're going after. Yep. So I'm to click through that. Yeah. And actually, before I click that and leave this page, I just want to call out Janice. You can also, um, come in here and look at the last contacted. So it might not be the most engaged yet, but you probably want to look at the ones who are most recently reaching out to you. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll come to select prospects. Cool. And then uh, something interesting to call out here is that little, that little bar next to email. Um, this is a, a dummy instance, but uh, this will tell you the level of outbound and inbound email activity that you're receiving from individual prospects. Um, so if you're finding that somebody is heavily engaged, I would create something like a, an engaged prospects tag that I would add to people um, anytime I come across an engaged prospect. Uh, Jacob, any any other thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I actually, in my previous uh, page here, we were looking at, I thought there was the same feature, but it's actually just on the contacts where you can look at the people who are last engaged with you. Um, so it's not showing you the most engaged with that one, but it will show you the last. And then this engagement one, this will show you the ones who are most engaged. So opens, clicks, replies, um, those things will be calculated um, to show you who are the ones who are going to be at the top of the list. Strong, strong. Um, cool. Well, while we're on this page, I think we could talk about the, the personas as well. Um, Something that I find really valuable while I'm drilling into individual accounts um, is to use persona-based sequences. Um, I'm not telling you to make 50 of them, but uh, some of them are helpful. Uh, so Jacob, if you go to add filter, um, if you've got all of this configured uh, correctly in your platform, you should uh, have a persona um, filter available there. And then I would search for you know sales leaders, marketing, executives, whatever, uh, target prospect is right for you. Decision makers, influencers, gatekeepers. Um, well, not gatekeepers, but uh, hopefully decision makers. Um, and then you'd be able to, to search for those personas here. And then very similar to what we did before, select one, two, or all of the prospects. And then uh, add them to a sequence using the collections that we set up before. Right? So it's all, it's all intertwined together with the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the cool thing about this and one, uh, I'll also call out smart views exists pretty much on every page that you can create something, right? Whether it's content or prospects, I can create a smart view of these prospects to just say, 
hey, these are my decision make decision making prospects of my top accounts. Right. That is a smart view that's more specific than the last one we made because the last one was just based on accounts. This one's based on prospects and accounts uh, and persona. Right. We could also do geo or title. Right. We don't have to just use persona. That's just a good one to distill the titles down because decision makers come in all titles, shapes and sizes. Right. So this is where we can add additional filters to understand who that prospect is, if it's the right piece of content. Uh, and to our point before, high touch versus low touch, to me, is probably the most categorization you need in terms of these personas. You could get more detailed um, to where you're like, make a sequence for decision makers, make a sequence for champions, make a sequence for influencers and have a different tone and a different language. Um, but high touch, low touch is more like high touch are the most valuable people and low touch are the people who can you know, help you get that deal across the line, but you don't want to spend a lot of time on. So um, this is where you can kind of break that down and create the smart views that are going to allow you to engage these people quickly and efficiently. Um, one thing I want to come back to really quick here is in these accounts, and I'll come back to the smart view we made, Jacob's tier one accounts. This is probably one of the most under, underutilized features I see that it, that's really basic of the platform. And it's easy to miss. But the question I get most often when I do trainings or even in LinkedIn, when people just hit me up randomly, they'll say like, I'm having a really hard time going to each account, finding the prospects, putting them into a sequence. I showed you this really quickly, but if you click on this checkbox, I'm looking at these three accounts. When I click select prospects, it is taking those prospects from those three accounts and giving me the list, right? We did that and we didn't really explain it very much, but that is what that process was. Right. So now you don't need to go into each individual account and pick out the prospects. You just cl you click that button, select prospects, and now I'm looking at just the people in those accounts. Right. This is a huge time saver because normally when I uh, do an interview and I watch somebody go through their process, they open up an account in every single tab. Right. They might have five tabs open with different accounts. They select the prospects they want from one account, put them in a sequence, close it, and they go to the next account put them in a sequence, close it. You don't need to do all that, right? It's especially hard to do that when you're using smart views and you've created some criteria of engagement. Um, so this will save you a ton of time uh, by just selecting the accounts you want and then filtering those prospects by that. Being, uh, being conscious of time, I want to ask you guys one more question uh, that's been brought up a couple of times, just in terms of performance. This is a good question from Matthew Dosh. How do you judge sequence performance beyond email clicks up and replies? He's specifically bringing up like how can how can or should we be digging into sentiment or any other north star metric while you're looking at it? Yeah. Yeah, Jacob, do you want to do you want to jump into the sentiment? I think it's I mentioned that at the top of the call. Um I think it's immensely beneficial to understand like what types of responses are you receiving from your prospects, not just opens and clicks. Um, Jacob, if you want to jump into that, I, I think it'd be beneficial to just quickly show it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, one, I'll preface this by saying this is a test account, so there's not really any data to actually show you. And I wish I had an account with fully enriched <laughs> like prospects that have gone through sequences. Um, but everyone is going to have access to the reporting features in outreach, right? So when you go into your reports, this is where you can start to understand how many prospects you're contacted, who's responded, who you've sent invites to, right? And one thing we didn't even talk about in this webinar is meeting invites. That is a, that, that is a huge feature that I recommend all of you use. If you're not using the meeting functionality in outreach, then you're, you're kind of going to miss some of the attribution that you're asking about right now. Right. So when I put prospects into a sequence, that's this top of funnel, right? This is where it shows me how many people have contacted. You should be adding them all into a sequence. I will say best practice, um, no less than 90% of the prospects you engage in outreach should be a part of a sequence. Um, and there's a few reasons why, but maybe I'll blog about that later. Um, emails delivered, calls, LinkedIn tasks. And then the next layer down in the funnel is actually the sentiment, right? How many people responded? How many people went through a sequence and responded? How many uh, email reply rates? That's the basic one. And then we get into positive, 
sentiment and objection sentiment, right? These things can help us understand not just if people are happy about our emails and responding in a positive way and booking a meeting, but if we get objections, what are the types of objection we're getting? That way we can be proactive with our next engagement with that same type of prospect, right? So that filtering we're doing with those smart views, not only is it helping us understand who to engage, but it's helping us understand what type of sentiment uh, those types of people have so we can engage those types of people differently in the future, right? And that might sound kind of meta and tongue twisty right there, um, but the data helps us understand what best practices are. Right. So when when people ask, what's the best practice? Well, let's look at your data. Your data tells us what the best practice is. And this is where we figure it out in these reports. Okay. Right on. I love that. And by the way, I think that's part of the answer of why sales hacker members uh, achieve quota 40 percent more often than their peers is because best practices are great, but they don't rely on them. Right. They look at their own data and make their own judgments. Um I brought up sentiment because it's one of these things that lead that, you know, you can go through, you can use your time efficiently uh, prospecting and outreach, but if you're not doing it effectively, you never get to the stage where you start using outreach to not just create pipeline, but where you start using outreach to also close pipeline. And I know that earlier when we asked um, in the chat, what people's roles were, a bunch of people here are closing sales or, or at least full cycle sales. So, um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to kind of take us home. We're going to shift gears here out of prospecting mode and into deal management, deal intelligence mode. And uh, if you could point out some of the lesser known or maybe time saving features in outreach in that regard, that would be awesome. Yep. Sounds good. All right. And if I can share my screen. Perfect. So. Um, flipping to the other side of the equation, as Colin said, around closing, um, I'm going to take you through kind of how to organize, similar to, to what we're talking about around how you organize yourself for prospecting. It's really applying some of those same concepts, but in a deal management capacity. Um, and so I'll actually flip over here and let me just move this um, into opportunities. And so um, it, this is our, our product instance. So the data looks a little bit funny here, but um, so if you don't have opportunities, uh, you need to sync inbound opportunities from your CRM allows you to populate this view. So you can really manage your, your deals um, from, you know, as you're thinking about planning your day, planning uh, what deals you need to, to address. And so um, as you look at this view, similar to prospects and accounts, um, there is a similar concept to filtering, sorting, and saved views. And you know where we see a ton of success with customers as they're managing deals is they're using these filters to identify and really focus in on what are the deals most pressing. And so I can filter to my own ownership. I can sort by who have I contacted last. We talked about engagement previously, but um, who do I need to re-engage? Has it been a while since I've engaged? And actually, one of the really um, kind of new impactful areas that we have here is the deal health score. And this deal health score allows you to focus within your opportunities on, it, it looks at a number of factors and it looks across uh, a set of, um, of customers and in cohorts that are similar to uh, opportunities of this size to say, this deal is on track or here's what's going well, here's what's where, where you need to focus. And so for this instance, you know, you can focus, you can sort by show me deals that have a low health score and you can even save it. So you have a saved view of deals at risk and you are looking at opportunities that you're managing, you sort by health score and you can identify where you need to focus and where you should prioritize your day. So really, you know, beyond just identifying, okay, which opportunities need my attention the most, we also give you cues around where you should focus. So this one um, doesn't have a meeting scheduled in the future, haven't had any outbound activity. This might be a good account to go in and go through that flow, uh, similar to what Roberto and, uh, and Jacob shared around finding those prospects with that within the opportunity and making sure that you're contacting them. The other area with the opportunity list view is that you can identify who you are reaching out to. And so if you're in a one-on-one -on -one with your manager or as a manager, if you're trying to understand who is being engaged in an opportunity, I can easily identify and see, oh, with this account, within the last 30 days, we've engaged someone who, Jim Jim, who's probably a decision maker and this other individual. So you can really see at a glance within a, you know, a rep's individual opportunity list, 
who are they talking to? Are we talking to enough people who have we not engaged with recently and really get a sense of where that opportunity health is at that time? Can I just add something to that, Sarah? Um, this is great. And I think this comes back to that point about how many sequences you should have, right? If you have a deal that's at risk, right, for whatever reason it is at risk and you need to send an email or do a task, that is a type of content that should be at your fingertips to say like, hey, I have a, I have a sequence for prospects that are in this healthy stage, whether they're healthy or not. Um, you might have a sequence or a template or a snippet for those scenarios. So this is where the content comes back around to the scenarios you're you're running into. Pre-creating that content is going to save you a ton of time. So anyway, thank you. yeah, this is great. Absolutely. All right. So that's really how we think about from a, you know, kind of tips and tricks around managing your deals, organizing your deals, just so that when you land on that opportunity list, who you're focused, you could have different views for maybe it's towards you have some big whales that you're going after that you have some open opportunities with and or as it gets closer to end of quarter you want to make sure you're really focused on your highest ARR your closest close dates and you can really prioritize those deals um, so these are kind of the the tips uh, in terms of how you manage within the opportunity list view the next area I want to focus on is how you organize your follow-up. And so this has to do a lot with the templates and snippets and some of that content structure that Roberto and, and Jacob mentioned. So when it comes to, um, you know, actually following up after a meeting, we talked to a ton of reps and it is the most important, but also can be very time consuming and painful to send that follow-up email. It's really impactful in, in moving the deal forward, but you want to make sure you've captured all the items you said you'd capture. You need to send over resources. You need to make sure you, you're sharing the notes that you uh, that you took and kind of moving that deal forward as much as you can. And so with Guide, uh, this is Outreach Kaya on the left. You can capture those items in the meeting, but I think kind of the most impactful part is the after the meeting ends. And it's sent to your email. So you have all of those notes and items captured and you can easily then populate it into a template. And so this is where it comes to, they shared the, the follow-up templates that existed before. You can have resources already in there, case studies ready to plug in. You have a section set out for next steps and you're literally pulling from what you've captured in the meeting. It's sent to your email. You can just trans transfer that to this, this template and send a follow-up. So if you have uh, you know, an intro meeting follow-up template you can send and you have a set of, of uh, you know, a set of resources you send with that and then a demo follow-up. So having those organized out so it's seamless after and it makes that follow-up email a little bit less painful. Um, and it, all you have to do is just kind of dot your I's, cross your T's, and, and you're good to go. All right. And I know I'm kind of flying through here to make sure, uh, make sure we cover everything. I appreciate it. Kind of squeezed you in. I'm sorry. So when it comes to follow up, again, get those action items sent directly, share the call. Um, I, I kind of skipped that part over, but it's very easy to, to grab the recording link and share that directly. Um, it's very flexible in terms of how long a, a prospect or, or a customer can access that recording. Um, and then again, it's about using templates or even snippets can be a smaller form of making sure that you just Give yourself a framework so you're not trying to recreate every single time net new custom for a prospect that you've got a framework that works um, that they can uh, you can send. Sarah, I can uh, I can add a little bit on like how this helps me as an AE. Um, if I had five, six, seven calls in a day, that becomes a, a very tedious activity to go back and find all of this information. But what I find really nice about this is that the email just lands in my inbox and Kaya will just send me the recording. It'll send me the uh, highlights of the call, what action items I have. So it's really easy once you get into a flow, maybe at the end of the day, just to have all of that information um, and fire that all off uh, as it comes in, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And then the last area I want to focus on is around the process. And so I think this relates to kind of um, as you're laying out the steps to success with a buyer, really focused on our success plans and how we've seen a lot of customers have uh, have success with that. I hated that I <laughs> put that in there, but not, not a better word for that than success. Um, so the first area is around success plan templates. So a success plan is a mutual action plan that you create 
Um, it can be buyer facing. There, are, there can be internal steps, and it lays out the entire process to getting a deal uh, closed and kind of mutual success with the customer. Um, and so, success plans. Right now, um, you can create templates similar, very similar to how we have um, frameworks for sequences kind of pre-populated. You can create templates to kind of guide your deal across the way. And so when it comes to if there's a specific um, template that you want to have for onboarding or going through a certain type of customer, if it's a new logo, if it's a current customer expansion, you can have these templates pre-populated in your, uh, in your instance for your org to use. Uh, we see a lot of managers, especially uh, in enablement teams, who really, really you spend all this time on medic and making sure that people are following a sales process. And this gives you that framework to make sure that the steps are laid out, all of the you know processes and, and milestones are in place. And then it's super easy as a rep to follow to make sure that you're you're seeing success with your customer and also the the template is laid out for you. And then this is a, a view of the success plan. So within an opportunity, um, there's a lot of different uh, you know, ways to slice an opportunity. You can look at the prospects within that. You can see sequences that, that prospects are active within. And at the end is, this, is the plan. And so the plan has the timeline. It has a set of success criteria that you've gone through with your customers and you've aligned on this is what success looks like. But one of the features that I think only some of our most really, really successful users with uh, with plans use is this buyer engagement feature. So buyer engagement tells you, you would invite prospects to the success plan. You walk them through it. You've set up, here is what our milestones look like. This is what the timeline looks like. And you can see engagement that they have with the plan directly. And so it's a way for you to stay on top of how engaged is my buyer? Have they looked? Have they commented? Have they made edits to it? And you can have a, a view of how engaged they've been, um, which just gives you another signal of likelihood or kind of um, gives you more confidence in their engagement and helping them get helping you get it over the line on their side. Um, so definitely, you know, buyer engagement is with under teams of success plans, you can drill in and when you click on a specific prospect, it'll show you uh, what that engagement looks like. So, you know, success plans definitely on the process side for making sure that you're kind of going through all of the different uh, milestones and covering all of the different, um, you know, resources that you need to. But I think on the on from a mutual success perspective, uh, buyer engagement is a really really important feature. Sarah, can I add one thing in? Yeah, um, I've run a lot of deal cycles in my time, and what normally happens is that. After every meeting, we either send them a recording or a case study or some kind of follow-up that gets buried underneath four to five other emails once we've had four or five meetings. And most of the time, there's always somebody that comes in at the end of the deal cycle and doesn't have any of the information, right? So there's a resources tab here where you can include those case studies, those videos, those recordings. And if anybody comes into the deal late, decision maker, anything like that, you can just add them to the plan and they'll have access to all of the information that they need. And it's not in some long email chain. Um, so I really find that valuable and, and kind of hidden from uh, uh, underutilized by, by some people. Yeah, that's a great call. And I think that's the, we focus a lot on having, you know, setting up the process side of it and having those milestones laid out for the seller. But I think to your point, Roberta, like the resources is super helpful, especially if you've ever been a buyer and you're trying to find, okay, I know you sent me this, or can you send me this again? And you end up playing email tag back and forth just to find a resource that is somewhere in your Gmail or Outlook. And it's just hard to find. So this again, consolidates it and it's in one clean location. So it's a really great buying experience uh, beyond just the benefit for, uh, for the seller. All right. And then the last bit, and I think this is, um, I think more relevant maybe now than ever um, around shifting dates. And so, you know, in current times, there are changes to uh, schedule to budget, you're trying to keep up with with the timeline. And so within this is what a the timeline of the success plan looks like. And you have a ton of different steps, you could have different um, sections of the plan, you have different uh, milestones within that. And if everything if you know, the buyer comes back one day and says, Hey, we got to kick this out a month that you know, we won't have budget freed up until then, 
all of a sudden your deal is a month off. And rather than having to go through and change each of these dates to reflect the, the new timeline, you can shift the dates cohesively with one, you know, one easy click essentially. And so shifting dates, again, it allows you to be a little bit more adaptive. And so you're saying you can move it up. Maybe it's good news and you and you know, the deal will come in sooner than you expect, or if you're pushing it out, it allows you to move it either way. Um, but it's a bulk action that just makes uh, kind of changing, adapting to changes in the deal uh, a lot simpler to do. So we've seen, you know, with customers that we've seen use success plans, we've seen a ton of uh, of success. And I think it actually has to do with um, especially the buyer experience. I think this is a, a differentiator in terms of not all buyers get this experience. It is fairly, it feels white glove and personalized and you can have a customer's logo in there. So it feels like it's a very, we're in this together, this deal, you know, we've got success criteria we've laid out. You've made it easy for them to find resources. And then you've made it very flexible um, in terms of timeline and kind of being able to add in steps that they may request. So really customization um, is a big part of this so that a customer gets everything that they need um, and you feel like you can stay organized and stay on top. This is in... All right. So just to recap, um, using templates, don't reinvent the wheel with success plans. Um, you know, organizations will use a, a kind of a, a called down number, I think similar to our conversation before about culling down content, making sure you're looking at the most impactful, um, you know, don't reinvent the wheel unless you have to. Engaging the buyer and checking how engaged the buyer is, it just gives you another signal about how how often or, or how engaged they are in, in this process. And then being able to easily shift dates around. So timeline change is not a problem. You can quickly do it with the date shifter. Right on. All right, looking, All right. Um, I know we're almost at time. And I want to be able to give everybody just at least a minute back so you can take a bio break before your next meeting. A few quick reminders. If you didn't get your question answered today, we're going to do our best to get you an answer. You can go ask your question on the Sales Hacker website in the forum there. If you're not a member, you can click join in the upper right. And I'll rope Jacob, Roberto, or Sarah, or some other member of the team in to get you an answer. Uh, and you may get a great answer from your peers too. Um, which brings me to my next ask. If you see an, a question there that you happen to know the answer to and you want to help someone out, do them a solid, pay it forward. Um, uh, we do these events twice a week. If you're a sales hacker member, you'll hear about them. If you're a sales hacker member, you're going to be 40% more likely to hit quota. Uh, and we will, uh, because there were so many great questions we didn't get to today, I think we can commit to doing something like this more regularly. Um, so that all of you get all the help you need creating and closing pipeline with outreach all the time. Um, until next time, thanks for stopping by. And thank you, thank you, thank you to our awesome panel today, Jacob, Roberto, and Sarah. You guys are all amazing. Really appreciate you putting together these tips for the community. You're the best.